let's make a start. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce everyone today. I'm delighted to have so many people with us um, and thank you for attending. So we're talking here today about generative AI and its impact on workforce productivity. Uh, generative AI is literally one of the most exciting and transformative technologies that we've seen it emerge in the last 15 years, probably since the advent of the smartphone. A couple of challenges for us really here are, one is the technology's ubiquity. This is what economists call a, a transformative technology, like a general purpose tech, uh, technology, like electricity or many other things that we take for granted over time because they become so ubiquitous. And so with such an influential GPT, and apologies for the ac acronym, obviously overlapping with general you know, transformers, um, the question isn't where we should deploy this in our enterprise, but like how quickly and to what extent and what sequence. So everything comes down as usual to the potential value at stake. How much is value is available for the different use cases and tasks that we want to automate? How much risk is there associated? And we're very lucky to have with us two of the most foremost experts uh, in, from academia, Eric um, Brunjolfsson and Andrew McAfee. And I'll introduce them now and I'll let them do the speaking because they're the ones who have conducted a lot of research on this and understand this very, very well. So first up, I'd like to introduce Eric Brunjolfsson. He's a co-founder of WorkHelix. He's a professor at Stanford and the director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab at the Institute of Human-Centered AI. He's one of the most widely cited researchers studying the digital economy, the author of over 100 academic articles, five patents, and five books. His research focuses on the effect of digital technologies on the economy. We also have with us Andrew McAfee who is the co-director of the Institute for the Digital Economy and a principal research scientist at MIT, Sloan School of Management. He is the author or co-author of more than 100 articles, case studies, and other materials for students and teachers of technology, including his latest book, The Geek Way, which will be out in November. He is also a co-founder of WorkHelix. Both of our guests have actually collaborated for many years and co-authored multiple articles together. Um, including the second machine, machine age, machine platform crowd, and others. And most recently, they've co-founded a company called WorkHelix, which uses their research and a vast data set that they've created to assess a company's generative AI opportunity and create a tailored roadmap that actually gets it. This data is also the basis for some of what they're going to share today. So without further ado, I welcome Eric and Andrew. I'll pass the floor over to you, and um, I'm looking forward to a great conversation. Neil, thanks very much. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Andy McAfee, and I have the great pleasure today of getting to talk with my friend, colleague, co-author, co-founder, uh, all-around alpha geek, smart guy, Eric. Eric and I have been, as Neil says, we've been working and talking together for solidly for more than a decade. And here's the amazing part. I'm not tired of it yet. And one of the main reasons I'm not tired of it is because I always learn from Eric, but I always get a chance to trip him up or troll him when we talk, and I'm not going to pass that opportunity up here. Uh, a little while back, Eric left the East Coast and went West in search of wildfires and um, earthquakes in California. And so we're now doing this across the country, which is a particular thrill for me. So... Uh, Eric, do you have anything you want to say before the grilling begins? Because I've got a bunch of questions for you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be ready for them. Um, I'm sure you'll have some new ones for me. But just remember, I can give as well as I can get. So uh, it'll be fun in both directions. <laughs> I, I have ample experience with that. All right, Eric, I want to start by referring to this terminology that Neil used. You economists are generally kind of a, like a sober, level-headed lot. Your, your job is to understand the economy, then your branding, the branding for your own discipline is the dismal science. But there's one thing that I found that you all are not dismal about that you kind of get giddy about. You talk about in these in almost mystical terms sometimes. And Neil identified it and abbreviated it. Um, you, you economists seem to go crazy for these things called general purpose technologies or GPTs. So can you start off by doing two things for us? Number one, define what these things are, a general purpose technology, and then can you explain why, why you and your colleagues are so over the moon about these things? Yeah, well, first off, we were all kind of pissed that we lost the acronym. for. We were using it for like a couple decades, yep. uh, GPTs, and now nobody thinks of it as a general purpose technology. But it is the one thing that economists do get excited about because as you and I wrote about in the second machine age, 
for most of human history, not much change for the average person. You know, people were basically living a little above subsistence level. There were kings and queens and empires and pandemics and whatever. Um, but living standards basically were the same until the first really important GPT came along, the first really important general purpose technology. Mm -hmm. That was, of course, the steam engine that ignited the Industrial Revolution. And since then, we're about 30 to 40 times wealthier uh, than our uh, ancestors were back then. Uh, but that wasn't the only one. Uh, Neil mentioned electricity was another very important general purpose technology. And today, I think that um, uh, general generative AI or AI more broadly is a general purpose technology, possibly even more important than the earlier ones. And given the importance to living standards and, and how people live, uh, that's a very big deal. I want to make sure I understand this. Are, are you saying that there's been this small handful of technologies that have lifted humanity out of the muck that they were dwelling in for these? <laughs> I mean, is is that about right? Is that, that is, that that is about deal? right. And, you know, the history books are filled with all sorts of other stuff, but it really boils down to this handful of technologies and they have three properties that set them apart from everything else yeah. uh, how, right how do that, i recognize one when i see one yeah so the the, the, the criteria are that tim bresnahan and, and manuel trachtenberg came up with were first off uh they are ubiquitous they affect almost all sectors of the economy different tasks they're not just in one little area secondly they rapidly improve and honestly nothing improves as rapidly as yeah. as ai so this makes the other ones look like pikers and thirdly, and this is the most important one, I think, is that they spawn complementary innovations, that you can build things on top of them. So, you know, electricity is not just light bulbs, it's electric motors, refrigeration, air conditioning, um, lots of other things. And likewise, AI is um, catalyzing a whole set of other changes. By the way, they're not just physical technologies. Often the, the new technologies in the way that economies use it could be new technologies for uh, marketing or business process redesign, mm. new kinds of skills. So we use the term very broadly. All right. And I, again, I want to make sure I've got this right. There is a, historically, like for all of human history, there is a small handful of these things. You got, you economists, you don't run around promiscuously labeling everything at GPT. It's a super high bar, right? So Eric, you said at least once that AI and, and more specifically generative AI deserves to be on that extraordinarily short list. Man, are you sure? Well, uh, in fact, I wouldn't just put it on the list. I would put it, I think we're going to look back and say it was at the top of the list because it ticks all those boxes. It does affect almost every sector of the economy. We, we're seeing this, the work that Daniel Rock uh, did uh, lay this out very clearly, all the tasks that are being affected. Maybe we'll talk about that later. No one's going to argue that it's not rapidly improving. And then these complementary innovations, and that's what, you know, Cohere, Work Helix are all seeking to document those more. But the reason I think it's arguably the most G of all GPTs, the most general, is that it's going after intelligence. And what's more important than that? You know, when I was visiting uh, DeepMind in uh, King's Cross in London a while back, they had this modest slogan on the wall. It said, our goal is to solve intelligence and then use that to solve all the other problems in the world. And I was like, yeah. That's about right. <laughs> All right. So you believe, and and you you know your career has been decades long. You've seen a few technologies come and go. You're not. This is not just recency bias. You think this one is probably at the top of the list. I, I think. I mean, think about it. What's more important than addressing intelligence in our generation? What we're doing right now. We're in the midst of doing that. The thing that worries me, though, is that most executives, most businesses aren't taking it seriously enough. That My technology friends, I'm here at, at Stanford University mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley, but really globally, people are pushing the, the frontier on the technology like crazy. But most companies are way behind the curve and they aren't making the changes. And there's a growing gap between what the technologies can do and what businesses are doing. And that's creating a lot of... Uh, a lot of disruption. Uh, I think there's going to be companies going out of business as a result. Mm. Uh, a lot of occupations are in turmoil, and mm. it's going to get a lot more disruptive in the next three to five years. You mentioned a guy named Daniel Rock, uh, who you and I both know because you were his dissertation advisor, and he is also a co-founder of Work Helix with us. You mentioned this fantastic piece of work that he did, based off work that you and he did <laughs> earlier, a few years back, that tried to get at how G, the, the GPT of generative AI is. Can, can you rattle off some of the findings from that work? We, we might well, get sure. a chance to I bring mean, Daniel first, later, but like hit the high notes. 
Yeah. First off, the, the title was cool. Uh, GPTs or GPTs. So you guys Great can title. Google it. Um, cause general purpose tech, you know, or, or I should say general pre-trained transformers are general purpose technologies. Um, but what they went through and used the methodology that he and I had, had initially done back when we were both at MIT, uh, he's at Wharton now and I'm at Stanford, um, where we take any occupation, you can break it down into basic tasks, like take a, a radiologist. Everybody talks about radiologists reading medical images. It's true. They do that. They actually do 26 other tasks, caring for patients, sedation, coordinating care. You can go through the all the other tasks, bus drivers, economists. Um, they all do multiple different tasks. You can look at each individual task and evaluate whether or not generative AI could help with that particular task. You know, summarizing a memo, absolutely. Lifting a box onto a truck, not so much. Okay. And as you go through each of those different tasks, you end up getting a picture of not just what that occupation does, but once you've broken down the, the occupation individual tasks, the cool thing is you can roll them back up to the level of a whole firm. And and the and, and, and um in that paper, they go through all of the different tasks. And a really important finding is Eric, how do you go through every task in an economy? That that's like a big number. There's about 18,000 of them, according to to ONET. So it is and, a and big Daniel job looked at every and, one of them with his own two it. eyeballs. <laughs> when, what, what did that's, he do? That's why we have smart people like Daniel and, and his team to, to go through it. Honestly, it's not something that I would I would recommend most people try to do on their own, but you can piggyback on that effort. Um, they involved a, a small army of crowd workers to evaluate them based on a set of rubrics. They said, here's the criteria that you evaluate them. And then you have these, uh, these thousands of people evaluate them. Uh, it also turns out you can use, uh, ironically, uh, GPT itself to evaluate it. And, it, it. and the spooky thing was that when you had the large language model do the evaluations, a lot of the answers came out very similar to what the humans were. So uh, it's sort of a little recursive effort there. But the end result was you get this picture of which occupations, which tasks are most affected. And one of the scary things for, for, for a lot of us was that uh, it's coming after a lot of uh, high paid professional jobs that previously were immune. You know, Andy, when you and I were writing our books, it was disproportionately lower paid jobs who were being affected by automation. But what Daniel's work shows is that there's a lot of middle skill and professional jobs, you know, lawyers, doctors, marketing managers, teachers, um, who have big parts of their work affected by large language models and other kinds of generative AI. Do you remember about what percentage of the U.S. workforce has, I don't know, um, at least 10% of all of its tasks amenable for today's generative AI? You know, uh, I'm scared now because Daniel's on the thing. I think I remember it was around 80%, but yeah. but he can pop in and make sure and, and correct me as uh, as uh, the student becomes the professor. But yeah. it was it was definitely a large majority of uh, occupations have at least some tasks that are being affected and are likely to be disrupted and uh, and a pretty significant minority that had a majority of the tasks being affected. And to be clear, that's just with the current technology, uh, GPT-4. Um, we all know that there are uh, bigger and better models coming out later this year and, 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 and early next year. So the disruption fund has just begun. I want to talk about a piece of work that you did with a couple of colleagues recently that I learned a ton from, because it was a very different piece of research where you guys, you all went deep in one company looking at one job and kind of you know, just a couple tasks that were exposed to an LLM. Yeah. And the thing I love about it is that everybody's been studying the impact of GPTs on coding. And it's pretty obvious that coders all over the world are very, very quickly adopting these technologies to help them with their work. Great. You went to a really different part of the company. You went to customer service, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think the lessons we learned from that are, are widely applicable. So let me, let me review them a bit. We looked at how call center and customer service reps were affected. And the important thing was that they, they, the companies were not trying to replace the workers, but to augment them. And I think that's something we see more and more is using these tools to allow people to do their job more productively and expand their capabilities. And in fact, in this case, there's about a 35% productivity improvement for the least skilled worker. So it's a big bump just in a matter of a few months. So this is not one of these hypothetical things. Someday, some big thing is going to happen. We saw that in real time, within a few months, this improvement. The Interestingly, the more skilled workers did not get as big a, big a bump. It was the less skilled workers who got the biggest bump. 
Um, also, the customers seem to be happier. We looked at customer sentiment analysis. You can look at the words in these millions of transcripts. There are a lot more happy words and a lot fewer angry words, less typing in all caps in the, that, that in the was, messages. Literally, that was maybe my favorite part of the research is that you had the idea to look at how often customers typed in all caps and after the technology <laughs> and that went that that went down. That's how I know I'm angry when I'm typing it, in it, all no, caps. No, absolutely. And, and we've all had those experiences. We get angry at the rep and, and that happens you know, too often, but it happens less often when the rep is getting help from an LLM um, and it's coaching them on the right answers to give them. And, and the reps themselves seem to be happier. Who, who would have imagined that reps like it better when their, their, their customers are happy. And so there was less turnover um, and they were sticking with the jobs. It's really one of these nice things where you get a win for the stockholders, win, win for the clients, win, win for the workers that weren't being squeezed. Um, so the technology was having a very big effect very rapidly. And I think there's a lesson there for basically every company that if they roll these technologies out, um, they can augment people, not replace them, and have it uh, uh, lead to better satisfaction across the board. You've used the words augment and coach a couple of times in describing this piece of research. So was this technology in this case, was it not getting people out of the loop? Was it not an automation no, technology? It, it, it was specific. I, I should say, Andy, the CEO of the company said that they, he had read Second Machine Age and was inspired by it. Um, so that was flattering um, to try to find ways to augment people. And I had to be clear, it's not always the case. There are certainly places where you want to replace pe the, the workers. But I think it's underappreciated that you can augment the workers and allow them to do new things they couldn't do before, handle more types of, of uh, processes. So and that's exactly in this case, what happened did, here. Did the, the technology just teed up possible things for the agent to say, and they could accept it or reject it or ignore it? Exactly. It was basically listening in on their conversations, and it would say, hey, this might be a good time to mention this feature, or don't forget to upsell them, or maybe don't use the F word quite so much, you know, uh, but basically coaching them along to... Uh, <laughs> to, to do the right answers. And, and, and the, the human operators did not always agree. They didn't always go along with it. Although in our data, we found that the operators that went along with the, uh, the LLM tended to do better on average. So maybe they should have been listening to it more often. But, but one of the reasons you want to keep a human in the loop is that we all know that these LLMs, they hallucinate at times, they make mistakes or confabulate, um, and they don't always have the answers. If there's not sufficient training data, they don't know what to say. So having a human in there can deal with kind of that long tail of unusual cases a lot better. You and I have been around the the world of, of technology intersecting with business and some of the holy grails of that intersection for a long time. And I think you're probably as tired as I am of the buzz phrase knowledge management, right? It's been this, this, this kind of shining star off in the distance that technology was actually going to let us harness and profit from all the knowledge of the organization. And to be super honest, it really has not happened. The story you're telling is kind of a story about successfully harnessing the yeah. knowledge of an organization and letting letting people, letting newer people, less experienced people have access to that knowledge on demand and make use of it. Am, am I painting too happy a picture? No, this is a real fundamental change. Some people call it software 2.0. Um, every organization has an enormous amount of tacit knowledge, um, things that have never been written down that we just kind of learn from our colleagues, from osmosis, from on the job experience. And that kind of knowledge has historically defied codification. I mean, how can you write you know, code of something that you don't even know what it is? Machine learning has completely changed that. It is literally learning. The machines are literally learning. They observe these millions of transcripts and they figure out what are the right things to say at the right time? So this this tacit knowledge now becomes codified through the machine learning system. It's it's a game changer because so much value in any corporation is in that tacit knowledge. And now finally we have a way right. to tap into it. But but Andy, I, in fairness, you've been asking. Me, I have a bunch of questions for you. Yeah yeah. Well, I, we'll, I, we'll get to them. I want to. I, I got. I have. All like right. You're going to keep grilling me. Okay. I'm going to keep grilling you because this it's just too much fun. Um, <laughs> I have a, I have a little question. Right. I'll and, give you, I'll give you one or two more and then I really okay. want to go after you. Okay, fine. I got a little one and then a bigger one. The, the little one is 
you're describing in, in this paper, which again, I, I, it's, it's, it, I love this paper. I, you know that I'm a fan of your work or else I would not be collaborating with you for a decade. I love this paper because you're, you're describing this very lightweight intervention, right? It, was, it, it seemed like it wasn't crazy expensive. It didn't take a huge long time to set up. Fast, and, yeah. and, and the good things started happening kind of immediately and they were substantial good things. I mean, is that about right? Yeah, that, that was something that was very unusual because in a lot of um, other big enterprise systems, you know, it, it can take years before you start getting the payoff. I've documented in other cases, you know, I won't name the, some of the big companies that, that roll out these, you know, $50 million enterprise projects that, that don't pay off uh, you know, for a long time or sometimes at all. This was one where we saw the benefits within a few months. And by the way, I, sh I should thank the uh, my co-authors. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lindsay and Danielle at MIT, who, who did a lot of the hard work to document this. Um, and people got up the learning with, with, with call center operators. It's important to get up the learning curve quickly because there's a lot of turnover. You know, a lot, a lot of them don't stay for a long time. So it's important you get this return quickly. And, and I don't think this is, you know, I don't want to overgeneralize. This is happening everywhere. But we do have a tool that can build on the existing infrastructure and roll out and get benefits very quickly. Um, and, and that's why I'm actually kind of optimistic about productivity in the coming years. Um, we've seen some pretty dismal productivity the past decade, uh, to my disappointment. But looking forward, I, I think we're going to have about twice as high productivity growth rate, closer to 3% per year rather than uh, the 1.4% that we've seen in the past. And by the way, that the Congressional Budget Office is predicting. And, and everybody, for an economist to predict a doubling of productivity, which is probably the thing they care about the most in their lives, to predict <laughs> a doubling of this is not, you are not making a cautious prediction here. All right, last question, and then you can turn tables if you want. Uh, with you, you, We've talked about augmentation, we've talked about coaching, but there is going to be automation happening here. Uh, do we need yeah. to worry about the job apocalypse and and is technological unemployment finally going to hit the economy in a big way? You know, there is such an overemphasis on that that it, it's frustrating. And, and and you and I keep telling, reminding people that that it hasn't happened for 200 years. I don't think this time is, is fundamentally different. There certainly will be places where there are job losses, but technology has always been destroying jobs. It's always been creating jobs. And so the real issue is the turnover and the dynamism. And companies that are prepared are going to gain jobs. I think that the best thing you could do to prevent job loss in your organization is invest in this technology, augment your workers, and make sure one of your competitors isn't putting you out of business. But I don't foresee any mass unemployment. I mean, you know, as you know, we're close to record low unemployment right now. Um, and with an aging workforce, we may have a job, a worker shortage more than a job shortage. So of, of the various list of concerns, that's not high on my list. Okay. So, so let me let me ask you a couple of questions though, because you are you're 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 at a B school and you have this new book. We we heard the Geek Way coming out about how companies can win. So now there's this new amazing technology, and some technologies kind of level the playing field, and some lead are kind of differentiators that separate the winners from the losers. Which category would you put this in, or can you decide yet? I have a strong um, opinion and a prediction, and it's a little bit counterintuitive. <laughs> Hush you. Uh, it's a little bit counterintuitive because you've given examples of, of light lifts that lead to big improvements. And I, I believe those examples, right? So coders all over the world are already using these technologies. I think customer service departments in lots and lots of companies are going to go through a similar process to augment their people and share the knowledge of the organization. So you see all that, you think, oh man, this is, this is a rising tide that floats all boats. To some extent, yeah, but I believe it's bigger effect. The bigger effect of generative AI is going to be sh to sharpen the differences between the companies that are good at technology and the companies that are not good at technology. And maybe we'll have time to talk about what that phrase means, good at technology. Yeah. But Eric, like you know, um, at the same time that technology has been pervading the economy, getting cheaper per unit. Think about what a unit of compute or a, a unit of software, a unit of bandwidth cost compared to where it was 10 or 20 years ago. While this has been happening, while the costs have been plummeting and companies all over the economy have been investing like crazy in this stuff. Eric, you know this, have the competitive differences among firms and industries, have they been getting bigger 
or smaller? No, this was actually our first conversation when, when I was visiting Harvard Business School where you were, you came into my office and we worked out on the blackboard how there was this growing gap between the leaders and the laggers even, even back then and it's only increased now. So so, so what distinguishes these superstars from everyone else? Is, are, do they have something in common? Yeah, you and I have a team of really great colleagues who have been doing research on what they call superstar firms. And they find that not just in high tech industries and not just in the United States, but very broadly throughout the, the richest countries in the world, in industry after industry, there is a small group of superstar firms that, you know, get it and that are pulling away from the pack. And the question is, what are they doing that's so different? And the reason I think that's a, an incredibly important question is that I have a book about it coming out later yeah. this uh, <laughs> later later this year, uh, where way. I tried to, I yeah, amazing, where I tried to dive in on that question, and it's at least a book's worth of answer, probably a library's worth. But I want to concentrate on one thing that I observed over and over and over, and it's a striking difference between I'm going to use a different phrase. I'm I'm going to talk about geek firms that just run themselves differently than the companies of the industrial era. I'm not sure all superstars are geeks and all geek firms. Not everybody that's full of geeks is a superstar firm, but man, on that Venn diagram, there's a lot of overlap between those two circles. And we should be clear, we're, we're from, coming from MIT, we both consider geek a high compliment. It's super, not like super high compliment. school where, where people didn't want to be geeks. We, 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 we really love geeks. That's why you and I are much, much happier in our lives than we were in high school, because that, that bit has flipped on that, right? So, Eric, geek is a term of praise and admiration in this case, and I wanted to understand what the geeks do that's so different. And uh, the, you, we've all heard the phrase MVP, you know, the minimum viable product, and that's great. And, and at Work Helix, you know, we, we, we follow that kind of lean startup philosophy. We're trying to understand what the customer wants and build what they want. Yes, yes, yes. There's another MVP going on. It's minimum viable planning. And what I mean by that is just willy nilly starting to do stuff without a plan is a really bad idea in generative AI and just about everything else. You need to get the team together and think about the opportunities and, and scope things out and not just blindly do what was on the cover of Information Week that week. That was back when Information Week was a physical magazine. So there's a minimum viable plan that needs to happen. And Eric, as you well know, the, the mission of Work Helix is to help enterprises, to help companies generate that plan. What's How do we think about prioritizing the opportunities yeah. that are out there? Great. That minimum viable planning is is critical. Otherwise, you're just you're just randomly chasing things that sound attractive. So, but, so I just want to be be clear here. I mean, it's not like you're born a geek firm and you can never change or or, or not. There's a way that you can transform an ordinary run of the mill firm into one of these geek firms and hopefully superstar firms. I, I think this is an absolutely huge opportunity because the more I looked around, the more I became convinced that you don't need VC financing. You don't need 50% computer science PhDs. You don't need a Menlo Park headquarters. These are relatively simple practices that get you a long, long way. Planning less is a, is a conceptually, it's a very, very simple thing to do. It's just hard for a lot of companies because we, we're subject to what Danny Kahneman called the planning fallacy. We love to plan. We sit around and analyze and think we're getting it mm -hmm. right. And I'll say this one more time because our company does this for a living. You have to do some planning, but some is the operative word there. And it's, yeah. it can be surprising how much benefit you get quickly from the planning. And then it's time to start doing. And the well, geeks- well, yeah. And Love. speed is of the essence. This is the frustrating thing. I, I see, as I said earlier, you know, there's this amazing technological opportunity, but so many companies are like deers in the headlights. They're not adjusting to this and they need a plan to take action. Every board that I've talked to is going to their CEOs, going to their senior executives and say, what is our plan? Yep. How are you going to address this opportunity? And that's the right thing for them to be asking because as Daniel's research shows and others, Almost every occupation is being transformed. And if they're not planning, they're going to be uh, left behind. Yep. So and, yeah, go ahead. And, and once you've got that planning nailed and the team kind of understands what they're going to do, then it's time to start doing. And particularly in a technology that is this new, that is changing this quickly. And frankly, it's weird. Generative AI is weird, man. The only way you're going to get experience with it and figure out how, how it actually works and how to make it work for your circumstances is by trying stuff. 
and not giving up if your first attempt at prompt engineering doesn't work very well. This is a, I mean, we don't understand how this thing works. This is a crazy yeah. piece of technology. So you have to jump in and start doing stuff. Go back and revise, look at the plan, look at the state of technology, you know, course correct and orient, but the goal is to launch projects, start doing, start learning and, and get your organization kind of generative AI um, uh, right. uh, in shape. Uh, and that will pay massive dividends. What, we, what we've if, talked about this knowledge management revolution. If you need to, if you want to go seize that sitting around and just planning for a long time and scoping out systems to the nth degree, I don't think it's going to get you there. Well, you talked about how some of these things are unexpected. And, and one of the approaches that I've seen a lot of companies use with success, I really love it, is these hackathons where they'll yeah. ask the whole company to take a day off or a few days off and work with the technology. Um, the amazing thing is that when people are playing with the LLMs or with the generative AI, the image generation, is um, and, and asking them to use it in their applications, they come up with things they can do with it that that the inventors of the technology didn't have in mind. In fact, one of the things you mentioned was all the success with coding. That was not something people intended the LLMs to be able to do. And isn't, right isn't now, it wild to even believe is is that true? It's true. It's true. They, they, they it ingested a whole bunch of stuff off the web. It happened to see a bunch of Python code out there. And it's like, oh, I get this. I, now, I'm, now I'm a Python coder. But but beyond that, these these emergent properties, right. you, you're seeing that that a, a company, somebody may be using it to do something in their law firm or their medical practice yeah. that no one at uh, one of the leading vendors had, had anticipated. And that's what's so exciting about this, that there's so many downstream complementary innovations uh, that are just waiting to be harvested. Amen. So I'll, I'll say it one more time. You need an MVP. You need a minimum viable plan. That's the starting point. Then go do stuff. Uh, I, I found out when I was researching the geek way that the agile software movement is one of these um, very rare movements whose origin can be precisely traced. There was a group of 17 alpha geek coders who got together in uh, the winter of 2001, 2002 in Utah. I believe it was at Snowbird because they were so frustrated with how software was being written. And it was this analysis heavy, planning heavy, document all the requirements and then give the binder to IT and they come back in 24 months and disappoint you. And it was just broken. This waterfall model was broken. And these geeks got together with no other agenda than to try to come up with something better. And you can go look, you can go look at the, the, the Agile Manifesto right now and the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. And the top of the website says, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Mm. Man, I mean, f find the appropriate part of your body and have that phrase tattooed on it. Because <laughs> once you once you get your MVP done, that's the way to go about it. This world, Eric, you and I know this world is changing so quickly. The technology is proving so improving so rapidly. You bring up that this GPT is pretty clearly improving faster than any, anything I think we human beings have seen before. That's how fast it is. Yeah. You are not going to master this without early and continuous delivery, without trying to do that early and continuous delivery approach. So Andy, we have a bunch of questions here from the participants. Should we should we take some of those questions? Um, we didn't, or I, we didn't I think, put everybody to sleep. Are you and I, are you <laughs> no, and I done by this. Like going toe to toe? Neil, Neil, you're the you're the host here. Uh, how would you like to go next? Yeah, totally. Uh, I'd love to get a few questions going for you for the two of you and um, go do a little bit of a spiel. Um, however, I, I'll do a little sort of recap of where we are i'd love to spend a little bit of time also just telling the the audience what cohere has found because we've been sort of talking to an awful lot of customers and uh, there's a few trends that a lot of people to be aware of and then i will shift over to q a and then it's going to be over to you two again to answer some really hard questions at least i hope they're hard that's the whole point i hope so too so there we go. So, um, so anyway thank you so much really really appreciate you being here um but i, I i'm going to Give you a few other things going on. I'm going to share a few observations that we've seen here at Cohere as well during our time. Um, and this market is shifting just incredibly quickly. So as you're mentioning, like general purpose technology, we've seen the evolution of the inbound inquiries and what we're finding of the conversations we're having with customers shifting very heavily from point solutions, be it summarization or doing better search or something like that. The 
overwhelming direction just now is towards what we would call sort of knowledge assistance, where you have basically multiple models working together to answer questions in human readable text, extracting information from corporate data stores that is real data that you can then use. So no more of this sort of, you know, hey, ask me uh, to make a poem in Shakespeare or something. That's wonderful and all. It's just not useful. But we're seeing really people want to get access to their data and put them into these models and get the information in human readable form. That's huge. It's really been a big shift in the last um, few, few months, I would say. Second observation is everybody's looking for a secure environment. Like this, is the, we're talking about the crown jewels here of an enterprise data. It's unstructured data that somebody could else could read if it ever got into the wild. Nobody, almost nobody, I would say, is willing to take that risk. The models have to go to where the corporate data is, not the other way around. And then the last is we're seeing, I would call it a few approaches. And this is really, you know, a sort of emerging advice, I would say, of like how to get how people are getting tripped up with their proofs of concept. This is an environment where the POCs can definitely get stuck in what's known as POC purgatory. Like mm -hmm. it's just never quite good enough, et cetera. And we got a few observations of how we see things working better. The first is that people are working on evaluating generative models and trying them with a bunch of prompts, et cetera. Firstly, the prompts work very different across different models. The second is we also think that approach is a little wrong. Really start with getting the corporate data. Your ability to retrieve corporate data that you're then going to feed into the model is by far the biggest determinant of success. It's all about this stuff called RAG or retrieval augmented generation that doubtless we're hearing a lot about. But we believe that that is the first step and the most interesting for making it likely that there'll be fewer hallucinations, more reality, and you're going to get the value that you want out of this. And then the last is academic benchmarks that we've seen. It, it, it just They're not always relevant. For what you want to do for the accuracy you care about, you have to just make it work for your users, not refer too much to those academic benchmarks. That's it. That's my little spiel of advice. No more for me. Um, ain't got any more, but you all do. So I'll ask a few questions here. Um, and I, my first one is around productivity gains. So the NBER study had productivity gains averaging 14%, but really ranging from not much to 35% for the less skilled novice workers. Right. Can you give some more examples of what you're seeing out there of the typical productivity gains that you might see in different tasks? Yeah, it, it, it ranges a lot. I mean, I think one of the ones that's been most documented, we've heard a lot about it, is encoding where you could have 50 to 100%. Um, one that it, it's harder to measure the benefits precisely, but there's there's clearly a big gain is in summarizing documents and then creating work. So for instance, in a medical application, you know, a doctor goes up, sees a, a patient, there's a stack of notes from all the previous uh, doctors and nurses that saw that person. They need to know what exactly is relevant to them as say a, a kidney doctor, maybe a small subset of that. LLMs are terrific for pulling out the part that's relevant to them. And then in turn, when they need to, to dictate the note, there's a few bullet points that they wanna say and the LLM can give a candidate, okay, here, here's what you usually say in this situation. And the doctor can review that and sign off on it. In both directions, it can be uh, a doubling or more of productivity, similarly in legal applications. Um, another one that I, I was surprised to see was uh, I was talking to a CEO who had to prepare for uh, his board meeting and uh, had to come up with a set of KPIs for the, the coming quarter and was kind of having a brain block, asked his team to help. And then he asked the... Uh, the, the city put in a bunch of information about his company and, and asked the LLM to help him with that. And it came up with a terrific set. Um, it can, they can actually be remarkably creative and look at these big questions, the things that, that Andy and I thought were not going to be uh, suitable for AI anytime soon, yep. but now we're seeing them happening. And that was a, a huge productivity gain as well. And Eric is bringing up something fundamental here. The gains that we're seeing are A, large, and B, they're in very, very different categories. He mentions yes. document summary. He, he mentions uh, the coding benefits. But there was a story in the New York Times a while back about how powerful generative AI is for doctors. And immediately you think, oh, but it can't, it shouldn't be giving diagnoses for patients. That's too risky. Maybe it is right now. This is not the benefit that the Times was talking about. It was talking about just transcribing and summarizing patient notes. Because apparently for a lot of doctors, that is two hours of work every day. And it, I, I'm, I'm very sure that it's among their least favorite two hours of work. The Times quoted one doctor who said, look, I retired because I couldn't type 
fast enough. <laughs> this is a, this is an astonishing waste of resources. This is astonishing. And the Times, again, right, their job is not to hype up generative AI. They said for some of the doctors studied that two hours went down to 15 minutes because it turns out that the technology was really good at turning this, turning speech into a transcript and then summarizing it following the form of a patient note. So the doctor reviewed that. You think, well, wait a minute, maybe the technology didn't do a very good job. Man, it turns out we humans do a terrible job of that. The research about how much physicians miss when they go down and try to write their patient notes at the end of the day, it's terrifying. We should not be asking people to try to do this. So I see benefits like that. And even though those are the most prosaic kinds of benefits, you're just transcribing and summarizing speech, man, that's a 600% productivity improvement for a physician on that particular task. Take that to the bank. That is a big deal. Now, over on the weird side, Eric, I, I think you saw this paper too. Some team of people had the idea to see if an LLM would be a good HVAC controller. Did you see this? Like, yeah, amazing. They, they hooked this system, hopefully not up to anything that we care about, but to some building and, and had the LLM control the HVAC in the building. And it apparently did a pretty good job of that. So again, man, we, we are just starting to understand this tool can put it to work. We're going to get those prosaic benefits. We're going to get some science fiction, holy cow, weird benefits. And to underscore how, how important this moment is, I went back and rewatched Ex Machina uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And that was a pretty cool movie. Uh, a lot of us nerds have seen it. It came out in, I believe, 2015 or 2016. And the whole premise of the movie is that this astonishing technology had appeared and they identified this one poor geek to fly off into the middle of nowhere and talk to this newly sentient AI. Here we are. This is what? This is on the order of seven years later. Everyone with an internet connection can have a more deep, nuanced conversation than that guy in the fictional film was having with the AI he was interacting with. Science fiction is coming at us very, very quickly. Wow. Thank you. By the way, I have to wonder if that HVAC machine was actually managing the cooling for all the GPUs it was using to do that. <laughs> right. We don't know if there was a net benefit or not, but it was a cool demo. <laughs> so, Excellent. so Neil, I mean, we, we can we could spend the next hour giving you lots more examples of particular cases, but I, I want to stress there's a systematic way of evaluating these cases. Earlier, Andy asked me there are about 18,000 distinct tasks that we've evaluated. I, I think Daniel Rock is on the line here. I think we should grill him and have him explain a little bit about the methodology for systematically going through not just a few different cases that we've each encountered, but systematically evaluating 18,000 tasks in such a way that you can prioritize which ones are more likely to be ben benefiting from these tools. Though there he is, Daniel. You want to you uh, explain how you do that? And for all of you listening yeah. in, professors never get tired of cold calling people. It's just one of the deep joys <laughs> exactly. that we have. Go ahead, Daniel. Hey, uh, oh boy, uh, here we go. I get, uh, I get, you know, cold called by Eric yet again. <laughs> you, I'm uh, never in flashbacks. Is this is this a triggering to you? Uh, yeah, but now I do it to my students as well. So you know, passing it on. Um, anyway, yeah. So we evaluate things in in a very simple way. We we ask a, a super straightforward question, and we evaluate that question. Uh, with both human judgment and GPT-4, and it's kind of funny how much they agree. So that question is, could you double someone's productivity in a, in a given task with no measurable drop in quality? And we look at all 20,000 odd tasks that the government says people do at work, and the answer can be one of three things. Either the answer is no, you can't. Uh, yes, you can with just large language models, or yeah, but it kind of depends. And that depends is, do we need to build other systems, particularly software systems around the generative AI technology? Now, what that lets you do is test like, okay, we know things are improving quickly. And as Eric said, you know, it's certainly pervasive. And then that last bit, the difference between the yes and the yes, but answers, uh, that tells us how much complementary innovation uh, it's gonna take to, to really unlock the gains for LLMs. And it turns out that's quite a lot. And Neil was alluding to some of the critical challenges there. You have to get your data in order. I mean, imagine, I think um, there's one stat out there, 80% of the world's corporate data is, is actually sort of this unstructured text or image or audio formats. 
We're unlocking all of that with uh, generative AI and it's really a new type of software. You can think of um, the lossy compressions that you're doing to use generative AI as being a new way to relate different data points that we've not been able to, to use for decision-making or in studies or, or in other kinds of software. So um, if to the question, I think someone asked it in the Q&A, like, why does this take so long? Well, it's, it's a totally new thing and we have to come up with good ways to do it. Best thing you can work on right now is getting all of your, your ducks in a row, making that data available, uh, getting the talent you need and, and so on, setting up those complements so that you can innovate quickly. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask something provocative here is one of the questions from the audience and it's along the same lines, but, and for Eric and Andy and Daniel, do you have any thoughts on the NVIDIA study that speculates that Gen AI will have more of an economic impact than electricity? It's quite provocative. I don't know if you agree. You know, I think it depends how broadly you define electricity. Arguably, NVIDIA is a product of electricity. And that's one of the cool things about these um, uh, GPTs, that they have all these spin-on effects. One thing I can be confident of is happening a lot faster. Um, in, yeah. in our book, we described how it took about 30 years for the payoff for electricity to come to America's factories between the 1880s and, and the 1910s, 1920s. That was how long it was before we saw a big gain. I already just described to you, we're already seeing massive gains right now. Yeah. So it's a very compressed time scale. Ultimately, it's hard for me to imagine anything less impactful than intelligence. So more, I would have to- More, more uh, impactful, more impactful. That. Yeah, anything more impactful. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> um, so so yeah, I, I think broadly that that's the right direction. But the, but the bigger thing is how rapidly it's happening and how behind the curve a lot of companies are still today. Yep. Let me, let me emphasize that a little bit because Eric's a fairly persuasive guy. And I think that when you look at we have this other form of intelligence out there that's going to augment ours. Okay, that's not electricity, right? That that that's that's artificial intelligence. But one thing we know from that time period that Eric was talking about, from the end of the 19th century into about the teens or the 20s, this period when the American economy was electrifying, the data are quite clear that the companies on top at the beginning of that shift were not the ones on top at the end of that shift. And I taught for a long time at Harvard Business School with Clay Christensen, who is this wonderful guy uh, and uh, just a, a mentor of mine. And he brought up, he, he popularized this idea of disruption. There's a whole lot of disruption coming. The companies that that are underwhelmed by this or too hesitant or, or can't, don't plan correctly and can't iterate fast enough. Well, man, they're in trouble in this world that we're heading into. That's good. Got another question about this. It's about reliability. So we we see that generative AI can affect multiple industries, multiple tasks, et cetera. But it, and it depends on how well it does it, how quickly it might spread. And the question I have here is that we spent maybe centuries, arguably, maybe less, but fine tuning things the, all the way down to Six Sigma. Mm -hmm. Will generative AI catch up to that level of reliability that it's going to basically cover all industries and functions? Well, well, hold on. The number of things that are anywhere near a Six Sigma level of reliability is very, very, very low. It, it, some semiconductor fabs have Six Sigma going on with, uh, with their yields. Um, civil aviation is a Six Sigma process. Our chances of winding up dead if we hop on an airplane are so vanishingly small that we don't need, that we don't need to worry about it. I, you know, in my opinion, most things are not anywhere Six Sigma. And the closer you look at how any company get, is run, the more amazed you are that anything gets out the door. Right? We're, man, we're, we we have a lot of processes that need to be improved. The opportunities are, are are immense. They're not small. They're immense. And to think that we're anywhere near the threshold of of how efficient or how productive we can be, I think it's a bad joke. And let me, I'll give you one quick example of that. Um, SpaceX as a company is, I believe, a, um, a product of this century. It's 20 or 21 years old. In that time, in one generation, it has become the first or company uh, in the world to figure out how to make commercially viable, reusable rockets. Nobody else in the history of the space race ever did that. SpaceX did it, and now they fly rockets and reuse them like crazy. They also 
are the only company that was able to deploy large numbers of rugged, high bandwidth, reliable internet terminals into a war zone after Russia invaded Ukraine. My question is, what have all the incumbents in the space industry been doing when this upstart shows up and just mops the floor with them? And I will tell you, SpaceX are fanatic about this very geeky approach to tackling very, very big challenges. And space is a nice analogy to generative AI because you have to do some planning for space. You can't just start building rockets however you want to. You have to do your MVP, your minimum viable planning. After that, try stuff. The rockets are going to crash. If they're not crewed, that is not that big a deal. And SpaceX's kind of go for it approach, this very, very geeky approach is making the rest of the space industry look quite bad. So I don't think we're anywhere near the, the, the ceilings of what's possible. I think the geeks are going to show up in industry after industry and deliver crazy amounts of value to us, to all of us citizens and consumers using Gen AI and the rest of the toolkit that's available. And let me say a little bit about how we might get to that that path that, that uh, Andy just described for generative AI broadly and LLMs in particular. There's two paths, one of which I'm, I'm a little skeptical of and one of which I'm quite confident of. I mean, one is just making these LLMs better and better. There are, are scaling laws that as you get more data, more compute, more parameters, you can predictably improve the uh, error rates quite a bit. And we have a few more uh, uh, orders of magnitude ahead of us in that. And that, that's good news. And a lot of people are confident that will make some progress. But inherently, these technologies are subject to some confabulation and some error. They're not designed the way uh, other technologies are, where you can prove their uh, th their output. That makes me more confident of a second approach that, that both you brought up, Neil, and, and Daniel brought up, which is combining these with other kinds of tools. You can have them call on databases. You can have them call on yep. symbolic processors. You can have them call on calculators. And so even though an LM may be very bad at arithmetic, and you can maybe make it better as you get bigger and bigger, and now they can do three-digit numbers, maybe four-digit numbers, yep. We all know that a much better way is to call on a calculator. And that I think is a kind of a path that will apply for a lot of different applications. And we're just in the process, I know your company is doing a lot of this, of connecting them to these other systems. And that's the way that I think we can get provably accurate answers. The LLMs are great for some kinds of, of applications. They can be very creative. Uh, they can be ingenious. They can figure out ways around problems that we hadn't seen before. Um, but when it comes to something that's provably correct, we have another set of technologies that we can tap into. I love that. And to think that the alpha geeks at, at Cohere and around the industry are not working on exactly the problems that Eric identified. And that's to mistake uh, where you are in a, in a point in time for a broad trend. There's a broad trend going on here. That's great. Fantastic. I, I have a question about employee retention and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So there was a question came in that talked about this, the call center study, which is yeah, right. you know, an industry that suffers a term. I'd love to hear, like, was there a net positive impact on retention and satisfaction from that? And is that likely to apply to other jobs as well? This was one of the happiest things I saw. Like, sometimes you can squeeze productivity out of people by monitoring <laughs> them and, like, yeah. watching them very carefully and just yeah. making their lives miserable. That's not what happened here. In this case... Uh, what we saw was that the people, they, they basically broke it into two groups. Some people got access to the LLMs and some people didn't. The people who were working with the LLMs, they seemed to be significantly happier. And it wasn't just what the reporting, we saw there was less turnover. And call centers are, are rife with rapid turnover. But in this case, the turnover went down quite a bit. People stuck around longer. And it relates to the earlier point. We saw that the um, the customer sentiment was better. And I've never been a call center operator, but I imagine that it's more fun working with happy customers than with angry customers. So maybe those two were related. It, it also seemed to get them up the learning curve a lot faster. You could compare how long it took them to figure things out with and without the tool, and they just got better at the job. And again, I, I think people probably enjoy being competent at their job more than, than not being that good at it. Yeah. So for all those reasons, we saw that the employees were uh, were were reported and acted like they were better off than before. How generalizable is this? I, I think it is actually quite generalizable because those underlying fundamentals that we saw in that case, they apply in most applications of these tools. So this is one of these things where it's not a zero sum. You take some from one group, you yeah. give it to the other group. This is making the pie bigger. 
Let me say one thing about that, because I think this is, is super important. Most people want to do their jobs well, right? This image of zombified workers just going through the motions, that, that's, that the data do not show that over and over. If we give people much more powerful tools for them to do their jobs, they will like their jobs better. This is a big benefit. That's terrific. I got one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, it's quite a big question. So just ask you, do your best to summarize as best you can. We can use an LLM if we want to cheat. That's okay. Um, <laughs> oh, I've been and, doing it the whole time. Oh, great. So so what's your opinion about what's holding back companies from getting on this journey? Is it concerns about data quality, skills, ethics, privacy, compliance? You know, is, is there a pattern here or is it, you know, no, get on with it. Well, there's, well, there's a, there's there's a lot me, of all those things. Eric, it's not the technology. Me, the technology is quite capable. But I, I think a big part of it, honestly, is just knowing where to prioritize that that people are overwhelmed with all these opportunities and they need they need a plan. That's why we started Work Helix was to give them a plan and say, here's where you need to prioritize. There's some juicy, low hanging fruit just waiting to be gone after. Um, and maybe they have some intuitions. But if you could do that in a quantitative analytical way, I think it gives them the confidence to proceed. Yeah, right on. And then to proceed is important. Proceed means go do stuff. Eric and I were at the same uh, party a few years ago where we were sitting around as, you know, by this weird series of events, having at cocktail hour and Jeff Bezos was there. And Eric, you remember this? I'm like, I am yeah. not going to miss this opportunity, right? So we're making chit chat with, with Bezos. And I said, I said, Jeff, I, what is the most common mistake you see other people trying to run great big companies make? And he didn't hesitate. He said they become too risk averse. They, they just stop trying to do stuff. Their, their career incentives are wrong. Something's not lined up. And they just become these kind of ossified um, status quo based organizations where they're not willing to go take a risk, fail at something, experiment, iterate, do those kinds of things. I, I thought it was an absolutely brilliant answer. James, you're talking uh, to a lot of these uh, executives. Uh, James is our uh, the CEO here at Work Helix. Uh, what are you hearing that, that's holding them back? And what are you hearing that, that unlo unlocks that? Well, <clears throat> unequivocally, the question we hear day in and day out is, look, we believe Gen AI is an incredibly capable technology, but where should we get started? How do we prioritize the opportunities? And I think a lot of executives have seen in the past that a pioneering person across the organization will just start deploying it without a top-down view as to where this can benefit. So, so really what we like to do is help folks and say, here's exactly a quantitative analysis at the smallest unit of work, which is a task, and here's where the benefit is and here's where to start. And you know that's exactly why we love working with Cohere, where we can work together on some of these early use cases, get wins on the board for companies and start the landslide into to growth and productivity. Bravo. Fantastic. Well, you know what? We're at time. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I can't believe it went by so quickly. Um, and I'm just going to finish up with a big thank you for everyone for attending and particular thank you to our panelists. So, you know, so Eric, Andy, Daniel, James, really appreciate you all being here. So, you know, our, our final sort of like spiel here is obviously if you're looking for some information about how to understand what the journey might look like and where the opportunities are for your company and what a roadmap might look like, where he looks is obviously doing that and please reach out to James on that and for anything to do with LLMs like you should know by now who Cohere is we work on secure high performance LLMs that are highly customizable for enterprise use cases please come to us and you'll find us as well really appreciate everyone's time you guys have all been fantastic uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime and in the meantime have everyone a wonderful week thank you Neil Cohere thank you very much we appreciate it